I want to welcome everyone out. Thank you for joining with us tonight. And put your hands together as we contend to lift up the name of Jesus. We're believing God to do something in your life tonight. Let's sing. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna. Your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come out your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Oh, yes, we serve a wonderful God, and then He walks through us and with us with all the things that we go through when life is good he's there when life isn't good jesus is still there he never leaves us he never forsakes us let's sing it out blessed be your name land that is plentiful streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name found in the desert Still I will 
Father's plan Sending us out Right in this broken land Sing it out, all authority All authority Every your voice and sing with me tonight, church. We will overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood Church, we give you all the glory, God, and we give you all the honor to your name, O oh Lord. There is none that can say but you, O oh Lord. Rama, ma, 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 we worship you, Jesus. God, we magnify your mighty name. You alone are worthy in this place, O oh Lord. He has and given us uh, in Christ Jesus. God, we thank you uh, for the precious blood of the Lamb. Thank you, God, uh, for the gift of salvation. God, we worship you, uh, Lord, that all victory and power is in your name uh, and your name alone, God, that you have given your Son uh, the name that is above every other name, that every knee shall bow, uh, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, God, we glorify you, Lord, for you are good and faithful God we thank you uh, Lord for your goodness uh, and your mercies Father God we thank you uh, I'm so grateful for his mercies that are new and fresh every morning every day his mercies are fresh his mercies are new 
You might have come tonight just dragging yourself in here, crawling in here. I just need to be in church. (laughs) Join the club. (laughs) We all just need to be in church. Amen. There's a great presence of God in this place, and God is going to touch people tonight and minister to our needs. He's going to help us tonight. Uh, We want to just go before the Lord. A couple of prayer requests. Uh, uh, Yvette Dominguez had a fall at work today, so we want to pray for her. I um, want to pray for uh, Ricky Jr. Uh, Ricky Jr. was born a couple months early. He's missing a valve in his heart. Uh, uh, one of the uh, our new converts who just recently started coming to church is her grandson. And so we want to pray for Ricky Jr. and just believe God for a miracle. How many of you know he might be missing a valve right now and in five minutes they find the valve that he was missing because we serve a God of miracles who does creative miracles. Our God is a creator. There's nothing impossible for God. And so let's cry out to God for Ricky Jr. and ask God to do a creative miracle in this child's heart tonight. We want to also pray for our service, God's spirit, God's presence in this place, that God would have his way. We want to pray for uh, the more than 145 people that gave their lives to Christ during this last week in the ministry. I see many of you here tonight. We're glad you came tonight. God's going to help you, but we want to pray for all of them. Let's just lift up those people before the Lord. Let's ask God to help them to be rooted and grounded. Amen. They, they prayed a prayer to start their new life with Christ. Let's pray, God, help them be established in the faith, that this would not just be a prayer and walk away, but God, help them, because you know That just as God has come and shown his light on their hearts, you know the devil is also going to come and try to drag them away. And there's going to be all kinds of assaults. We need to pray. This is spiritual, church. We are fighting not flesh and blood, but we are fighting principalities. There are people who have been bound a long time, and the devil's not going to be happy to see them go. And we need to fight for their souls. And that's going to happen in prayer. That's going to happen in follow-up. That's going to happen in reaching out and praying and speaking supernatural words in due season to their hearts. God, God has people here tonight. He wants to use you to speak supernatural words into people's lives that are, that are just, they don't know if they can make it, but you can speak a word that can transform, not because it's your words, but because it's God's words and the living water flowing through your life and bringing healing and help uh, to people in need. So let's pray. God, position me and use me in a supernatural way that I can be, make impact on people around me. So let's pray. Let's lift up especially, uh, just again, Ricky Jr., let's pray for a creative miracle I'm going to ask uh, uh, this evening uh, if uh, Brother Dave Fish, if you would just come and let's open our service in prayer. You pray for your own needs right now as well as these. Father, we're so grateful for your presence. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us. We thank you for the cross of Calvary. We thank you that by your stripes we are healed, Father. We come before you, Lord, with this service tonight. God, we are asking. Hallelujah. Father, we come before you. We thank you, uh, Lord, for your goodness. We pray, God, for all of those souls, the 145, uh, Lord, that you saved alive, God, recently in the drama. God, we pray your hedge of protection to be round about them, God. Uh, Lord, that the evil one could not touch them and break forth. Uh, And Lord, we pray, let the Holy Spirit begin to work in their heart and life. Uh, Lord, begin to dig into their life and help them to be firmly planted in the grace of God. Lord, let your grace prevail upon them. Lord, help all of us to be able to reach out to them and encourage and strengthen them, God. Lord, help them to see that this is a church that genuinely cares for them and that the gospel is real and that the gospel is not a one-time affair, but you can be at work in their lives. And we pray for Ricky Jr. God, we pray for a supernatural miracle right now. Lord, together as we pray, uh, let the Spirit of God do a creative miracle and cause that valve to appear, uh, Lord, to be in place and functioning right now at this second when we pray. Uh, Let the blood of Jesus touch that young person, God. Uh, Lord, and we pray tonight, anoint the Word of God. Uh, Move upon the Word. Uh, Lord, let it go forth and accomplish what you desire to do. And Lord, we pray for Yvette Dominguez, God, you'd heal her from her fall, God. 
God, touch her in her body. And Lord, touch everyone here that's sick in their body, God. Move and loose the power of the Holy Spirit. For the gospel is a gospel of demonstration and power, Lord. Move by your Spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Why don't you take a moment and, and uh, greet somebody before you're seated. Introduce yourself to someone you don't know. Amen. Lord bless you as you find your seats. We want to welcome everyone that has come out tonight. Thank you for taking the time on this Wednesday night. Amen. This is different tonight. God is going to move. God is moving, and you are in the right place at the right time. If you're participating with us online, we are very sorry you couldn't be with us tonight, but we are asking God to touch you as he is going to touch us here tonight. Amen. We just want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, for those of you that may be new, we do have a lot of ministry that happens Throughout the week, tomorrow night is our Spanish language service at 7.30, uh, meeting in the fellowship hall across the uh, courtyard uh, tomorrow night, 7.30. And then we also have uh, many different things on Friday. We have small groups. Uh, we have uh, youth ministries for high school and middle school. Uh, and we have college campus ministries as well. Uh, it says that Vision and AO are going to be together uh, at the church this Friday at 7.30 with tag team preaching. So that's going to be a, a good time as well. And then Sunday morning, our Sunday morning service is at 10 o'clock. What I'd like to ask you to do tonight is to please, if you can be available uh, to uh, follow up on someone, reach out to someone who got saved. There's 140, I think 148 I think is the total uh, over the last week, starting with the week before Easter. Uh, I mean, that Sunday morning we had some 20 saved or something, and then it's just kind of a lot of momentum. It is no good if we pray with 145 people, but we don't follow through and follow up on them. God wants to use you to reach out to somebody. So if you prayed with them uh, at the altar, you have a responsibility to reach out to them and say, hey, I'm the person that prayed with you at the altar. Can I help you? Is there anything I can pray with you for? You know, that introduce yourself. But also, maybe you didn't pray with somebody at the altar. Would you see Pastor Ed in the lobby after church and just ask him, make yourself available. Is there anyone I can follow up on? Anyone I can help out? And then that's part of the process of evangelism. It's not, we're not just trying to get them to the altar. We're trying to get them to heaven. <laughs> and that's a process, right? And so everything between from the altar... Uh, into heaven. And so uh, we, we need your help. The kingdom of God needs your help. And so uh, I appreciate each of you making yourself available for that. We're going to hear a couple of reports before we receive the offering tonight. We had uh, a couple of uh, a, kind of a team. It ended up becoming like a team uh, going with uh, evangelist Peter Ajala uh, to the Congo. And uh, let me just say, um, I, 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 I so appreciate uh, our evangelists, especially uh, when they when they make these trips. You know, um, this is a lot of work, and uh, especially you know what they go through over the course. It's it, it's spiritual. Their families are here. They're there. I know when I go out to preach, there's a there's a different something. But this kind of trip is is hard. Going into Africa, going into different places, and and uh, I just so appreciate our evangelists uh, that that do this, that make this effort, that have a great attitude while they do it, and just are so grateful to be used in the kingdom of God. So tonight we're going to hear from Brother Daniel Murphy, and then Evangelist Peter Ajala is going to come and give us a report of all that God did uh, in the Congo. And so let's welcome Daniel tonight. Good evening. Um, yeah, I went to the Congo. Uh, I didn't go to film or anything like that. Um, the way I kind of got into going to the Congo was um, last conference, David Hamilton preached a sermon that like really touched me and beyond just touching me. Um, there was a spirit about him um, that I think I've been searching for for a really long time in my own spiritual journey. And so I remember telling myself, like, uh, I need to get to Congo one way or another. 
Um, so I told Michael, like, hey, you know, if you're going, let me know. Uh, luckily, this year, he's like, I'm going. And so, uh, you know, because I'm going on my own, I kind of had to, like, you know, uh, get myself there. And so I remember calling my mom and saying, hey, I have this crazy idea to go to the Congo, da 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 And with the, the first thing she said was, uh, you, you have to go. You'll change your life. And um, she wasn't wrong. You know, we landed. And the receptive just love of the people for all of us and the care and um, was just overwhelming. Um, and, you know, there were so many things to, to, to point out, but you know, the church being built there in Port Noir is amazing. And just seeing the fact that whatever you give, the pennies you give them, they'll turn into dollars. Just the, 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 the fruitfulness of whatever you give to them, they, they're just so willing to use it. And, um, and so just, just, it was interesting, though, because you have a country that has um, obviously very impoverished. A lot of, most people make less than $400 a year. Um, then you have a government that's kind of oppressive. Um, you know, it's kind of a country where you have the president's picture in, in all the businesses. So it's very, like, uh, oppressed culture. And then for me, not speaking French, it was going to be odd or weird for me to try to figure out how do I learn from people that I can't understand. Um, but it was very evident just watching their spirit that it emanated from beyond the language barrier. Um, both churches are primarily made up of people from 25 or younger. Um, so they're very young churches, and, and I think the word of God is, is gripping the young people there, which is uh, really amazing to see. And um, just being able to shadow Michael and Zach and Peter and just watch them do what they love and, and, and how, show how they minister is, was a master class in learning for me. Um, but also being able to shadow David Hamilton as if I was one of his disciples for just a week was a, a blessing that I would never be able to repay back, um, no matter how much I do try to do in return. And the whole time I was there, every night before service, I would read Second Corinthians 4, and I would just read the chapter, because it was the chapter that was something that I was dealing with within myself, hoping that I would find an answer for uh, something within me. And the Christian people in that country exhibited this verse so well that it finally clicked for me in a spiritual level, not just on a, a mental level. And I'll read that for you. It's um, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And that is what I think uh, Pastor Alvin is always talking about, how you know, you know, Africa's no joke, is they have that there's something that goes beyond understanding with the fact of where they're at and what type of country they live in, but the joy and the love and the peace that flows from all of them. And so I just want to thank the church and everyone else for the opportunity to go. Um, it was a life-changing uh, trip, and it was a blessing. Thank you. Bless the Lord. Oh, my. Well, I'm, I'm just so grateful to have been privileged to be able to go on the team and just to be a part of what God's doing in the nation of Congo. If you don't know, uh, we're actually the first representation of the Tucson Church in Congo. And so it was such a profound time for us. Um, I've actually never been to that region of the world, never been to that part of Africa. Uh, as you know, it's French speaking. They were colonized by France and they gained their independence in 1960. And so uh, the national language is, is French. And so that was a major barrier uh, trying to communicate and, 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 and minister. Uh, but thank God we had great uh, translators, interpreters, and that worked out just fine. God began to move in these cities. Uh, Brazzaville, which is the capital of Congo. So we're talking about the Republic of Congo, not the DRC or the Democratic Republic of Congo, because they're not the same. Um, and so uh, just ministering there, uh, seeing God move, uh, people getting saved. I know in Brazzaville we had 35 
decisions for Jesus. When we went to Point Noir, we had 12 people that prayed. Um, usually when I go on trips, uh, whether it's national, international, uh, one of the things that I like to do is I, I have a notepad where I, I, I record what I call takeaways, things that have made an indelible imprint upon my heart, perhaps uh, things that I find quite fascinating or maybe even lessons that I've learned. And so I always try to extract something when I go, no matter where it is, whether it's a pioneer work, whether it's a church with 500 people in it, it doesn't really make a difference. There's always something that can be learned. And so um, I, I, there are a couple of things that really do stand out to me when I, I travel. One is uh, the, the highlight miracle or perhaps the highlight conversion. Uh, when we were in, in Brazzaville, I remember I was at the hotel and the, 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 the gym coach, so the hotel had a gym and they had a coach there. Actually, his nickname was Coach. Uh, and I, I met him in the dining room and we worked out together. And, and so we're sitting together, we're having breakfast. I'm, I'm, trans, I'm, I'm, I'm witnessing to him in French indirectly. So I got chat GPT and I will speak to and I'll say, translate this. And so chat would speak French. And then he would speak back, I'll say, what was that? Then it would speak English to me. And then I was able to witness to him effectively that he came to church that night and got saved. Uh, I, uh, th this was like the highlight for me, you know. And, and so, you know, just communicating with him uh, since we've been back. And he's been back to church and he's doing well. Uh, he's got a Bible now. He's starting to read. He's, he's wanting to know, what, what, what do I do? What do I read? I said, we'll start with the book of John. And so that was a highlight uh, conversion, a highlight uh, uh, miracle. Uh, there was one person that got healed. They had a shoulder, neck pain. They got healed, uh, even though that was great. Thank God for that. But what really stood out to me was one of the nights I, I ministered on the orphan spirit. There was a lady that came to the altar. She prayed. I ministered to her. And uh, the following day, for the first time in her life, her father contacted her. And she couldn't believe her earthly biological father. Uh, she didn't even know who her dad was. Uh, she's an orphan from birth. And yet her father, after her, the ministry and her prayer at the altar, God was willing to, to work a miracle for her the very next day. You know, when we went to Point Noir, I, uh, I, I, I was just, it, it was profound for me. Uh, there's one verse that stands out. It's the book of Colossians chapter 3 where the Bible talks about service with singleness of heart. And so I was watching the people of Point Noir. I'm watching the people of Congo in general and realized that they really did serve with singleness of heart. The, the word singleness actually comes from a Greek word that uh, is rooted in the word that means to fold together. It's like to put everything into one, to consolidate everything. Their whole heart, their mind, their aim, their goal is to serve Jesus with all their heart. And they serve with singleness of heart. They serve selflessly. They serve without complaining. I mean, I'm talking about uh, they've got harsh conditions uh, they don't, they don't, they have blackouts. I remember it was intermittently. We're having blackouts. We're preaching. We're having worship services, a blackout. And we just continued. They continue to worship God. They carried on like nothing was happening. Nobody was complaining. It's like, this is, this is incredible. You know, their generator can't even uh, uh, power a fan. And uh, that's in one of the churches. The other church doesn't even have a fan. Everybody's dripping with sweat. When you get off the main road, you've got to walk over 30 minutes to get to the church. We're talking about water and mud puddles, uneven terrain. These people with their kids, they don't even care. They just keep coming. Every night they would come to church. Every night they would walk back over 30 minutes uh, through uh, uh, just tempestuous uh, conditions, uh, uh, understanding that they, they were there for a cause, for a purpose, for a reason, and that is to serve God. It brings conviction to us. And I thought, God, we need to invest in this nation. We need to pour our lives here into the nation of Congo, help to support this church and to help these pastors uh, so they can fulfill the destiny. We have three churches in the nation of Congo. You know, the pa pastor, uh, uh, David Hamilton, he's already planted out two guys. Uh, uh, the second guy that we preach for is already running over 100 people uh, in, in, in about four years or so. I mean, just an incredible atmosphere of believers who are just like us you can travel the world across and you will find that we're all the same 
It's the same spirit that drives us. It's the same energy, the same force, the same vision, the same anointing, the same power. Folks, I'm ready to preach right now. But thank God, I really do thank uh, uh, Pastor Garrett for sending us, Pastor Warner, all the expense. Uh, you have no idea. Our way back, we, we flew 31 hours. I mean, it was a trip of 31 hours. We're stuck at the airport for another six because we missed our connecting flight. But looking back, retrospectfully, it was all worth it. And thank God. Amen. Amen. We thank God for those reports. Would the ushers come this evening? We're just going to take our uh, Wednesday evening offering. Those churches are there because for the last, I think, nine years, we've been investing in those churches and in that nation. Uh, we uh, put thousands of dollars there every month so that the missionaries can be there. And they're doing an incredible job of raising up disciples. You know, every time we plant a missionary, they have one job, and that's to replace themselves with an indigenous disciple <laughs> and a pastor who can take on the work, a local. And uh, that, that nation is very dear to my heart. It was actually the nation I wanted to go to right after Gabon. It's uh, right under Gabon, and uh, it's very similar tribes. And I tried convincing Pastor Warner that Sarah and I could go there for the next three years and, you know, start a work because I had such a, a, a burden for the nation. Uh, one of our girls who is now a pastor's wife in Gabon, uh, she's from Brazzaville. And so she would always talk about it. She would always say, please send a church. Uh, and uh, when Pastor Hamilton was available, that was the first not only nation on my heart, but on his heart. And uh, it was just an open door, a Macedonian call, and God's doing a tremendous work there. It would not be possible without our faithfulness in our tithes and offerings and world evangelism. I want to thank you for your faithfulness, and I want to encourage you to be encouraged by this report, by these testimonies. Hundreds of lives are being changed all around the world. This is just one little nation. We have churches in over 60 nations, and things like this are happening all around the world, and we support those churches on a monthly basis. Every month, we send out about $60,000 to support the churches that are out there. It costs a lot of money to do what we do, but it's worth it because of the reports that you heard tonight. When people get to go there, they see, and their lives are changed. This is what I've been investing in. And so I want to encourage you, let's give unto the Lord this evening. Remember your tithes, your offerings, your conference pledge, but remember world evangelism. Don't be afraid to give extra to world evangelism, especially at the beginning of the month when we're sending out all this money. Keep it on your mind. First of the month, we got to send out a lot of money. Hey, let me, God, will you, if you put money, if you get money to me, God, I'm going to get it into that account, and you can just give to world evangelism. It goes right to that account. That's all we use it for is to, to support churches like this, and so I want to encourage you this evening, and you're giving our heads about, uh, Brother Irvin, would you pray for the offering? Magnify Jesus, magnify the Lord, magnify Jesus, magnify the Lord, for He is worthy, for He is worthy, for He is worthy to be praised. Alaba Señor, alaba a Cristo, alaba Señor, porque es digno, porque es digno, porque es digno, y el doya son, y el doya son. Magnify Jesus. 
Jesus, magnify the Lord, magnify Jesus, magnify the Lord, for He is worthy, for He is worthy, for He is worthy. To be praised, to be praised. Let's welcome Pastor Webb to the platform. Thank you, Pete. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. If you have a Bible, turn on your device if you don't. And if you don't, then you can see the verses of Scripture on the overhead screen. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Just... What an incredible presence of God and great things are happening. I just want to commend all those who were involved in the production of Rise. I mean, what an incredible, I mean, <laughs> you had me in tears again. I was, uh, I thought, no, I'm good. I've seen it. <laughs> it moved my heart. And, uh, and then I was also very impressed. I don't know. There's nothing that excites me more than seeing someone get saved. Um, uh, and uh, to be able to talk to them and see something happened in their life. But uh, I was blessed to see people who were uh, praying with people at the altar and just helping and uh, amen. We can only do what we do as we all do it together. And uh, amen. Thank God. Uh, the best is yet to be. We're going to press on. <laughs> Hebrews chapter six. We are. Uh, looking through the book of Hebrews, and I've chosen the theme of the race of faith, taking from Hebrews 12, verse 1, where it tells us that we are to run with endurance. The race that is set before us, the Christian life, is like a race. Uh, I was talking to our brother uh, Richard Aviles. He was... Uh, uh, he went to Sunnyside as well, and so we were sharing stories. He had the same coach that I had, Coach Milky, uh, who was a track coach at Sunnyside Junior High. Then he went to Sunnyside High. Then he went to Pima College, won a national championship there. But Richard was telling me that, uh, uh, that uh, the track team there, they were getting ready for the Benson Invitational. Amen, the big race that was coming up. And so uh, they didn't have any hurdles, but hurdles was an event. And so the junior high didn't have hurdles at that time. And so uh, what uh, Coach Milky did was he went and got some 55, empty 55 gallon drums, and he put them, spaced them out uh, on the football field. And then he had them, Richard being one who ran and had to jump over the drum and uh, move to the next one. And, Till they finished uh, the race and uh, and then he said oh you guys look like a bunch of ballerinas amen so I use that as an opening illustration because you know the Christian race is a hurdle race really and uh, I mentioned before how that uh, uh, coach Milky he put me in the steeplechase. I'd never ran the steeplechase. It was a race, it was a meet, and so I've got to run and jump over steeples. I've never done that before. Uh, and uh, it wasn't the easiest thing. Do we have a picture, I think, of uh, what a steeple is, a hurdle? Uh, I think we can show the first one. All right, well, the resolution's not the best, but you get the idea. Uh, you got to jump over the hurdle or the steeple. And uh, there are many hurdles that we have to clear in the Christian life. You, uh, you just got to get over some things, some things, some barriers that are in the way that if you're going to run the race with endurance, if you're going to finish your course, then you've got to get through this. You've got to get past this. Uh, and uh, the book of Hebrews is so powerful in that it is warnings. There are a number of warnings, and we're going to a little bit later read through all the warnings at once, and it's very uh, impactful as we consider these stern warnings. But what I love about the book of Hebrews is after there's a very stern warning, there's a word of encouragement. Hallelujah. How many know that's how God works? Amen. He challenges us, 
and then he encourages us. But tonight, all you're getting is warning. Amen. If you want encouragement, you got to come back Sunday night. The apostle, yeah, if you know about hurdles, the, the rule in steeples or hurdles is you can't go around them. <laughs> uh, if you do, you're disqualified. So you got to get over the hurdle and pass the water, uh, and then you can continue to run the race. Uh, and the apostle Paul, when he was talking about the race of his life, of his ministry, he made this statement uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. And he's saying that, you know what, I've got to get over some things in my life, uh, because if I don't, I'll be disqualified. And God help us that that would never be the case that we would be disqualified. And in Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to find that there are some people who find themselves or found themselves disqualified. And Hebrews chapter 6 is one of the most challenging uh, passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. In fact, I'm not sure that there are many passages that would uh, stir up more controversy and different perspectives and and so God will help us to get through this I think as we work through it we'll see that it becomes very clear we don't have to be one of those who are disqualified that we can get over the hurdles and the barriers that we need to get past uh, and we can be successful so let's read verses 1 to 9 Hebrews chapter 6 where it says Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of re the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So the first hurdle I want to consider with you that we must get past, we must clear the hurdle of immaturity. And this is what the apostle has been talking about. Uh, as a matter of fact, as we read through the book of Hebrews, you know, it's, it's broken up into chapters and verses, but that wasn't in the original. It was written in the form of a letter. Uh, the chapters were added later to help us so that we could find our place and easily navigate through Scripture. But there are many times when I question and say, why did you put the chapter there? In fact, this chapter would have been better to start back in chapter 5. And I want to read beginning verse 11 through to verse 14 in the New Living Translation to pick up the Apostle's train of thought. He says, there is much more we would like to say about this. And he's talking about Melchizedek. And we'll really get into that in chapter 7. But it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. Amen. Do I have everyone listening? Amen. <laughs> don't be spiritually dull. Amen. Tune in. Uh, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. 
Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. So he uses that word training there, and it's the word, actually, we get our name, our word gymnasium from that. He said, you know what? The Christian life's like going to the gym. Evangelist Peter talked about working out. Uh, uh, you know, we need to work out our salvation, the Bible says. We need to, uh, we need to exercise ourselves unto godliness. And so we're working out and we train our muscles, we train our lives uh, to do what needs to be done, to be able to discern what's right, what's wrong. And he says, you know what the problem is? You haven't done that. You're not doing that. As a matter of fact, he says, you're like little babies that need to be bottle fed. Now, the apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 2, 2, and he's talking about people that had come to faith and their encounter with God. He said, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And we should hunger for the word of God. Amen. Uh, as it's already been said, start in the Gospel of John. We begin to work through that. Uh, and before long, you know, you'll be masters of the scripture. It, it, you know, you'll have some foundational principles that you can build your life on and will help you to be victorious and overcome and be all that God wants you to do. But. In this passage, the author of Hebrews is saying, you know what? It's time to get off the bottle. It's time to eat some solid food. Now, my wife and I, well, we were in Canada. We knew a woman, I won't mention the name, but she nursed her male child till he was five years old. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> Coming home from kindergarten, Mom, I want some milk and cookies. <laughs> but he's saying kind of that's where you're at in your Christian faith and walk. It's like you still need to be nursed. In fact, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, but we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. They had just come to faith. They need that. How many know we're babes in Christ? We need a lot of nursing along. We need to be, you know, helped along. But there should come a time in all of our lives where we get past the hurdle of immaturity. And here... The author is saying, you know what, I wanted to talk to you about Melchizedek, but you're not there yet. But you should be. Amen. And so, verse 11 again of chapter 5, there is much more we would like to say. But it's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You know, there's great revelation. There's wonderful truths. And, and let me tell you, you can spend the rest of your life in the word of God and you'll never get to the bottom of it. I mean, there's so much wisdom and knowledge and revelation and truth. It's incredible. I was listening to uh, a pastor, well-known pastor, and uh, he was preaching from this word, and, and, and I looked at the comments after, and, and, and someone made the comment, you know, I wish he would have actually explained what the scripture was talking about. His whole sermon was regretting that he had treated the people of God like babies and just spoon-fed them all along. And he was rebuking himself the whole sermon for, you know what, I should have challenged them to rise to a greater level to have some understanding and comprehension. I don't know, but when I get to the end of my days and stand before God, I don't want God to say, wow, why'd you treat them like a bunch of babies? And so in verse one, he says, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles, those basics of Christ, uh, 
Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. The word perfection there is the Greek word telotes, uh, which means the thought of completeness or maturity. Someone that's developed, someone that's strong, someone that's mature, someone that has a fullness to their personality. There is a strength to their character. And he's saying, listen, uh, you know, we want to be able to move you forward, amen, into a place of maturity. Uh, and, and when he says, let us go on, it literally means let us be carried forward. Let's move past this uh, and let's move into some deeper truth, some deeper water. Rod Mattoon, the author in his book, Treasures from Hebrews, he says this. If you are not growing, then there is something seriously wrong with your spiritual health. You either have a priority problem, an attitude problem, or a sin problem if you're not growing spiritually. Something is definitely wrong. God says, grow up. Now, how many know that babies are cute and we love them? But if your child's 10 and you're still changing his diapers, there's something just not right. Amen. Verse 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And, and then he says, not laying again the foundation of, and he's going to give us some foundational truths, some fundamental principles that we should grasp, that we need to get a handle on, that we need to understand what this is all about. And he, he has three pairs. He, he couples together uh, some qualities that, and some doctrines that we need to understand. The first uh, is repentance and faith. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Those two things go together. Acts 20, verse 21, testifying to the Jews and also to Greeks, uh, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the starting point for the Christian life is repentance. It's where we start. And what repentance means is that we have a change of mind. Metanoia is the Greek word. It means uh, we change our course. We decide we're not going to go this way anymore. We're going to go that way. Where we've been walking in our will, doing our thing, we have a change of mind. Now, I'm going to go for God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to turn from my life, my will, my sin, and I'm going to serve God. That is repentance. You have to make a decision that you're going to leave sin behind. Turning to God means we're turning away. And when I got saved, thankfully, uh, Brother Kevin Greer was there praying with me at the altar. You need to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop doing drugs, stop. I'm like, OK, check, check, check. And I did. It was repentance. Amazing is that God gave me the ability to do that because I had tried to do that on my own. I knew it wasn't right. I knew it was destroying my life. But God met me there and he granted me repentance. Repentance isn't remorse. Where we just feel bad about what we've been doing, though that can lead us to repentance. Repentance. Repentance is not regret. Repentance is change. Repentance is not, well, you know, every time I get drunk now, I feel bad about it. Before, I used to just do it. No, it's like, no, I stopped getting drunk. Amen. Repentance is a gift of God. Acts 11, verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. They're looking at these Gentiles and they've turned from sin, their old ways, and they want to serve God. And they're like, whoa, look at that. God has granted them repentance. 
It's a gift. Now, make a note there because that's going to be important as we move on to verse 4 and 6. And then faith. Faith is trusting Jesus. Repentance towards God and faith towards Jesus. Lord, now I'm looking to you. I'm trusting in you. I need you to save me, and I'm believing you to do that. I believe you died on the cross, rose again the third day, and I'm believing you're going to help me to live this life. I'm turning to you. That's faith. We trust in his death on the cross, that our sins are forgiven. The scripture says it, but now we choose, I believe that. And also faith is a gift. Amen. It's something that God enables us to do. To, to, I choose to believe, but God is there enabling us to have this faith. And then he goes on and he talks about it after you have repentance and faith. Then you move on to what? Baptized. Now, some of you were here. You gave your life to Christ. The next step of obedience is baptism. And so he goes on and talks about baptisms, the doctrine of baptisms, that's plural, and the laying on of hands. Baptisms. Well, there's baptism in water, which... Uh, is a sign of identification. We identify with Christ. We identify ourselves as a Christian. It's an initiation. It's the entering into the Christian life. We are baptized, uh, and uh, it's a sign of being buried. Our old life was buried, and now we're walking in newness of life, this new life, this new Christian life. It's symbolic of washing our sins away. Thank God there's forgiveness. Amen. All our sins are under the blood. We get a fresh start. That's what baptism's about. But then there's also the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus commanded them and said, listen, you wait here. Get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 verse 5, he says, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You know, it's the baptism of the Spirit where we're filled with the Holy Spirit that we gain confidence and boldness to witness and to be a testimony. And what we could not do in our own strength now becomes possible because God's Spirit is in us and He's helping us. Baptism of water, baptism of the Holy Spirit, but there's also the baptism by fire. Amen. John the Baptist said, I'm baptizing you with water, but there's one coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What is the baptism with fire? Well, it's God's refining work. It's where we go through the fire. Luke 12, verse 49 and 15 Jesus said this, I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Amen. He went through a baptism of fire as he went through the cross. But all of us will have our baptism in fire. Mark 9, 49, for everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. You know, our lives are going to be seasoned with fire. And Peter said it this way, 1 Peter 4, 12, Beloved, do not think it strange considering the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So we're baptized in fire and God does that not to hurt us, but to perfect us. It's his refining fire that causes the impurities of our life to surface and he skims them away. So what we have is something that's of value, that's strong. It's a baptism of fire. And if you're going through trials, Peter says, don't think something strange has happened. It's all part of God's work in your life. 
And then he goes on the laying of hands. And we don't have time to take to go into this at death. But through the holy laying on of hands came the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They prayed for people. They laid hands on people. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and there is an impartation of spirit that comes through the laying on of hands. Uh, Jesus said, listen, go lay hands on the sick and they will recover. There's power, spiritual power in the laying on of hands. And all of us are commissioned to go lay hands, pray for the sick. And not only that, but through the laying on hands, there's the ordaining of ministry, the setting aside of people to the work of God. Acts 13 says, after they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them away. David Hamilton was sent away with the laying on of hands. And now we heard about the work of God in the Congo. And then the last two foundational principles are the resurrection. Hallelujah. What a glorious Foundational principle that was, we celebrated Easter. Pastor Garrett preached a wonderful message uh, and the, the resurrection, hallelujah. We ought to live in the light of that. Uh, it, there's going to be a rapture one day. Some are going to die. Others are going to be just resurrected in a twinkling of an eye. In a moment's time, there's going to be this transformation where they receive their new bodies. Amen. You know, when you pray with people that are sick and weak, dying. We do so knowing that this is only temporary. Amen. You're going to have a body. Hallelujah. No more pain, no more suffering, no more. It's going to be eternal. Hallelujah. That is the hope of the believer. That is foundational. And then the last one, he says, is eternal judgment. There is a resurrection of the just, and we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. Amen. How many know that all of us are going to give an account? Whether you're saved or not saved, you, for the unbeliever, they're going to stand before the great white throne of God, judgment of God. The Bible says the books were open. And the works, the life, the testimony, even Jesus said every idle word that is spoken, people will give an account of it on the day of judgment. Amen. I've said a lot of things. But when we understand that it causes us to live our lives with an element of circumspection that, you know what, I'm paying attention. I don't want to go over the edge. I don't want to violate God. I want to be able to stand with a good conscience and give an account of my life, not perfection, but at least I determined to do your will, and there will be a reward for that. Hallelujah. So I want to think with you, secondly, about clearing the hurdle of unbelief. We have a picture here um, from the Olympics. Can we show that? That's, that's the one for clearing the hurdles of maturity and maturity. That's it. Uh, he didn't quite make it over the hurdle. That's the danger of running the hurdles. How many of you feel like that's your life? You know, <laughs> just, that's me. I'm... <laughs> Maybe you've been through a time like that. You've stumbled, you've fallen. Uh, you didn't get past that. You know, sin is delusional, isn't it? Amen. Uh, no problem, I can handle that. And then you end up on your face. Well, we have this hurdle of unbelief that is always warring against us, trying to infect our hearts Move us away from faith. And that's what he's talking about here in verses 4 to 6. And these are the verses that trouble people. And maybe you're here and at one time you backslid and you, this is a hurdle for you to get past this. It, it, you know, you're condemned, which that's not the Holy Spirit. But these verses are a hurdle for people to get through. For some people, you know, they believe that once you're saved... You know, you can never fall away, but 
This scripture actually says something different. So I'll take what the word of God says. I don't know about you. Amen. Rather than trying to fit scripture into our doctrine, let's just let the doctrine come from the scripture. Verse four to six, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Amen. Now, the first thing I want to point out here, if we're going to comprehend what's being said, is there is a change in pronouns. Now, amen, pronouns are important in our generation. You've got to call people. But he starts in the first three verses. He's talking about we and us. And then when it comes to verse four through six, he starts talking about those and they. So here are people that are no longer part of we and us. These are outside of that. They are those and they. So who are those people that this scripture is referring to? Well, for one, they are people that were once saved. Verse 4 and 5. For it is impossible for those who were once saved enlightened they were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift what is that well the bible says that by grace are you saved it is the gift of god salvation is god's gift hallelujah thank god for that we don't deserve it he gives it to us and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. So you've actually entered in, you've been through that baptism. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Now there are some people that they say, see these people were never saved because they only tasted. You know, they were people, they were around Christians, they heard about it, they had a little taste. <laughs> but... That's the same word that's used in chapter 2 when it says that Jesus tasted death for all of us. How many know he just didn't lick death? He, he actually died. Was dead for three days. So it's not just a matter of having this light encounter. These people actually entered in. They were saved. If they fall away, the phrase, I want to read what the Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Commentary says. The phrase, if they fall away, may better be rendered having fallen to the side. And it depicts a runner who has fallen to the side of the track during a race. Can we show that picture again? He was in the race, he was running the race, but all of a sudden, he's not in the race anymore. He might not even be in life anymore. I don't know, that's a pretty serious <laughs> fall. He's fallen by the wayside, and that's a picture of what can happen to a believer if they are not careful. He can fall out of the race. Because they failed to clear the hurdle of unbelief. And he goes on to say what they've done is they've actually crucified to themselves again the Lord Jesus and put him to an open shame. Again, I want to read this. It says, if the original readers were Christian Jews contemplating returning to Judea Judaism, then they were joining the ranks of those who crucified Christ. It amounts, in essence, to a fresh public rejection, a crucifixion, symbolically, of Christ all over again. So here are people that have come to saving faith. They've known God. They've experienced him. 
But now they've joined the ranks of those who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Imagine having had an encounter with God, experienced God's grace and goodness, and then to be one of those who, as Jesus was tried, saying, crucify him, crucify him. That's what the scripture is saying. Putting him to an open shame. So these are the people that have had a real encounter with God, but they've fallen away from that. And now they're mocking, they're belittling, they're putting down Jesus Christ and salvation. You know, it is sad, but the Bible says in the last days there would be a departure from the faith. And you can go online, you can go into comment sections, you can find out there were people who were at one time believers, but now they mock the word of God, they mock scripture, they mock righteousness and morality and the principles of God's word openly. You know, that's dangerous territory. Jesus warned people when they were trying to say, oh, you're casting out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. He said, you better be careful there because all sins will be forgiven man, but he who commits blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it'll never be forgiven him. You better be careful. You're on a line and you can step over it and you can find yourself in a place, the scripture says, it is impossible to renew them unto repentance. Remember, repentance is a gift of God. You really need God. If you're mocking him and expecting that, he's just going to grant you repentance. Now, thank God the mercies of God. And, and let me just say that God says, I'm married to the backslider. It's not a matter of someone just backsliding. It's a matter of someone going beyond that to belittle, to mock, to put Jesus to an open shame. And there, I've talked to people. They're wondering, is this verse about me? Because, you know, I was backslidden. I, did, I was saved once, but I did some bad things. No, the Bible says the righteous person will fall seven times and rise again. Amen. But the warning is, you better be careful. Because I can tell you the people that end up in this condition, they never planned to get to that state. But it happened. Where slowly they embraced unbelief. You know, it talks in Hebrews 13, 3, verse 12, it says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So we need to clear that hurdle of unbelief. The third thing I want to close with is clearing the hurdle of futility. Now, we have another picture here. Um, That's not how you want to end up. Amen. <laughs> uh, she's not going to win the hurdle race. The Panamanian hurdle racer in 2015 found herself headfirst in the water. Amen. And we don't want that to happen to us. So let's read on in Hebrews chapter 6. It says at verse 7 to 9, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. Amen. That's God's purpose. The earth would receive the seed, would be watered with rain, would bring forth fruit, and we would all be blessed by it. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. 
But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. But if it bears thorns and briars or thistles, it's kind of like running through the desert, and we should all know about that. I take my dog for a walk. We have desert all around where we live, and so I'm taking him out. And he came from Canada, so he's, he's a novice. He doesn't understand the desert. And so when we first started on our walks, he would stop, and he would have cactus in his foot. And so then I would have to take the leash and try to pry it out, and he would scream, and uh, we got through it. <laughs> Didn't take him long to realize, keep your eye out for those little cactuses that fall in the trail here. And so he learned his lesson. But listen, as we're talking about unbelief and people of unbelief, the scripture says they're like thorns and thistles that are in the track that we have to navigate. And if you're not careful you're going to find yourself with cactus in your feet, your spiritual feet. Matthew 7, verse 16, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He said, you know, you can tell if a person is saved, they're bearing good fruit. Uh, you know, they're growing in grace, but then there are those, you'll know them because they're thorns and thistles. And when you get around them, they're prickly. They'll poke you. Goes on in chapter 12, he talks about how be careful of any root of bitterness springs up and defiles many. People that are filled with bitterness. He says, but you know, we're persuaded of better things for you. That's not going to be your testimony. He says, you know, we're persuaded that what you will have is the fruitfulness that accompanies salvation. And the Bible talks about the fruit that we can expect. First of all, the fruit of the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. That's the fruit uh, that the Holy Spirit produces in us, that we have a good spirit, a right heart. Righteousness literally just means to be right. We're right with God, and we labor to be right with men, not prickly, bitter. In fact, Hebrews 12, verse 11, he goes on to say, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You know, part of the fires we go through is to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. We get along with people. Amen. We're right with God and we're right with people. And then we could talk about the fruit of praise. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us continue to offer up the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So in contrast to those who are mocking, that are putting Christ to an open shame, our lives give praise to God. The fruit of our lips, we worship God, we give him glory, we give him honor. And the scripture says, those people will be blessed. Amen. So I want to read this as we bring it to a conclusion. I want to read through these warning passages. And I want you to dial in. Just listen for a minute and we'll bring this to a conclusion. But we're going to put all the warning passages together. And I want you just to think about it like if the author was writing to you. Like if you were one of those Hebrews there that was thinking about going back, that life had become hard and you're vacillating. He says this, verse, Hebrews 2, verse 1 to 4. I'm going to do this in the New Living Translation. It says, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard. Or we may drift away from it. For the message God delivered through angels has always stood firm and every violation of the law and every act of disobedience was punished. So what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? And God confirmed the message by giving signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit whenever he chose. 
And then he goes on in chapter 3 and says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. Remember what it says today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And then chapter 6, verse 4, for it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But if a field bears thorns and thistles, it is useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. And then Hebrews 10, verse 26. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were a common and uh, if it were common and, and unholy, and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy to us. For we know the one who said, I will take revenge, I will pay them back. He also said, the Lord will judge his own people. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Finishing with Hebrews 12, verse 14. Work at living in peace with everyone. And work at living a holy life, for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Make sure that no one is immoral or godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as the firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, when he wanted his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. Let's bow our heads together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You know, these warning verses are the love of God because he wants what's best for us. If you've come in tonight and you're not saved, you don't know Jesus, your sins have never been forgiven, I want to just tell you that the love of God is here and he gives repentance. He moves in us in a way that we want to change. We don't want to live the life we're living. We want to head a different direction. And then he enables us to do that because we're born again. He puts his spirit in us. And what we could never do in our own, he makes possible. And if you're here and you're not saved, amen. Salvation is God's free gift to you. If you'll turn and you'll just exercise the faith that God gives you to believe that Jesus died on the cross for you and rose again on the third day, the Bible says you'll be saved. Amen. It's God's gift. And we want to pray for any that are here, you're not saved tonight. If you were to die, you have no peace, no confidence that heaven would be your home. And the Bible tells us that we should know that we know that we have passed from death to eternal life. We, we can be very confident about that. 
We want to pray. You're here. You're not saved. Would you slip up your hand as no one looks around and say, Pastor, I want to get right with God tonight. I, I want to know that my sins are forgiven, that heaven is my home. Include me in this prayer. Slip up your hand very quickly. You've come in and you're not saved. Amen. God bless you. Our sister over here, you can put your hand down. Others, you'd say, me too. I want to get saved. I need to get right with God. I don't know if I was to die, whether I would go to heaven. You should know. You can know. It's the one thing you really have to know. We want to pray for you. Slip up your hand. Say, that's me. I'm not saved. I want to get saved. I want to turn my life to God. I want to turn around. Amen. I'm going to believe God to touch me and help me. Pray for me. Slip up your hand quickly. And then I believe that there are some people here that, you know, you're playing around. Okay, we have another hand over here. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. One time you were saved. You know, don't play with your eternal soul. God is a merciful God. He's married to the backslider. He doesn't give up on us. We can walk away. But he's waiting for someone to call out, amen. And the very fact that you feel that tug and that desire tells me that it's not over for you. For those who it's impossible to renew, they can't have a change of mind. They've, they've come into a situation in their heart where they're beyond repentance, but you're not there. And the very fact that you're feeling that and sensing that is God's mercy. He wants to help you. Can we pray for you? Others who would join these honest hearts say, that's me. Pastor, pray for me. I'm away from God. I need to return. This is a wake-up call. Heaven has spoke to me. I want to get right. I need prayer. Slip up your hand. Amen. Thank you over here. God bless you. Another honest heart. Others join these. We're not going to hold this for long, but you're here and God's dealing with you. Amen. It's the love of God constrains us, the Bible says. He pulls upon our heart uh, because he loves you. You can join these honest hearts quickly. We're not going to hold this for long. Just slip up your hand. God bless you, sir. God bless this. He's over here. Amen. Honest hearts. Thank God for you. Amen. Others, join these just one last time. You say, that's me. I want to. I want to go for God. Amen. I want to get right with God. Amen. Then I'm going to ask those who lifted your hand, I want you to just come and meet me here at the altar. We want to pray with you. There will be someone to pray with you. Would you just stand out of your seat? Just come and make your way down here. Amen. Just over here, our sister, thank God for the honest heart over here. These here, would you just come and meet me here? We want to pray with you. There will be someone to pray with you over here. Amen. Just slip right out of your seat and come and find a place to pray. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I believe that God warns us because he cares about us and he wants us to make it. Don't play around with your soul. Amen. There's grace to help. We've already read the scripture. We can come boldly before the throne of God. Amen. Who understands he's been through sin and temptation. He's there for us. We can find help in the time of need. It's there for us. But we need to go on to maturity. Amen. Time to understand spiritual truths. To give ourselves our mind to the word of God. Hallelujah. I believe there are people here. God has spoken to you. We're going to open the altars. Let's, uh, let's worship God together. These altars are open. Find a place. Let God seal to your heart what he's spoken to you tonight as we worship him. Care for others 
like Jesus cares for me. Let your rain fall upon me. Let your rain fall upon me. Lord, we humbly come before you. We don't deserve of you what we ask, but we yearn to see your glory restore this dying land. Spirit, touch your church, stir the hearts of men, revive us, Lord, with your passion once again. I want to care for others like Jesus cares for me. Let your rain fall upon me. Let your rain fall upon me. Let your rain fall upon me. Lord, we worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We'll give you praise and glory and honor. Praise God. For yea, my people, I would say to you that I have drawn you to myself by cords of mercy. And yea, even your repentant heart, is it not my gift to you that I have worked in you? And yea, I have begun a good work in you, and I will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. Trust me, look to me, and shall I not visit you and strengthen you? For yea, I am able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or even think. And my power is available to work in you and to strengthen you. Be not weak. Be not timid, be not uncertain nor fearful. Be strong in me and in the grace that I make available to you. And surely I will go before you. I will direct your steps. I will lead you into the fruitful life that I've ordained for you to live. And surely blessing comes on those for whom it is prepared. And I have prepared a great thing for your life, saith God, that ye not even, not only in the world to come, but in this present evil age, shall I not bless you. Trust in me, look to me, be strong in my spirit, and surely I will do it, saith God. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise, can we? Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace and goodness and strength. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen. We are going to dismiss. We appreciate everyone that's come out. You gave your life to Christ. Wonderful decision. Maybe uh, you didn't pray, but uh, God's moving in your heart. You can say a prayer. You can open your heart. You can walk out of here a different person. Amen. Reach out, talk to someone. They'll be able to help you. We're going to dismiss. uh, I wonder if our brother Abbasai, you would just dismiss us in prayer. Thank you for joining us online today. If you gave your heart to Jesus, we'd love to reach out and encourage you in your new faith journey. You can get in touch with us through the link in the description that says, New Believers Start Here. Below this, you can also find links to send prayer requests and questions to our pastors. While you're here, browse more sermons on our live page and turn on notifications so you can know next time we go live. See you then.